Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I'm really excited to be here. You're right here at RightsCon um, at our session here, which is going to be discussing global connectivity. Where are we heading next after COVID-19? So thank you and welcome uh, for joining uh, this session. So I just want to set the stage. I've got an exciting panel with me um and it's going to be very interesting i just wanted to set the stage um so that we can have a sense of where we are now when it comes to connectivity and digital cooperation so 50 percent of the world is unconnected today um possibly higher now that we have COVID 19 and uh, what the two lessons that COVID 19 has shown it's that we have a glaring inequality uh, in, in, in internet access in the world and then secondly, internet is not a luxury, it is a lifeline. So we are 10 years from 2030, where we would we are all hoping to have universal access and there are goals that countries have signed up to. And we need to take stock and, and have a renewed sense of purpose on how we are going to achieve meaningful and universal broadband for everyone by that date. So in 20, 2018, the UN Secretary, uh, Secretary General and Antonio Guterres was uh, as assembled a high level panel on digital cooperation. Last month, this high level panel came together with a, with a, a host of um, various players, including private sector, civil society and governments to look at a set of recommendations which were presented to the international community. And two of those key set, there were eight principles that were lined up, which we'll be talking about uh, shortly. But one, two of them that stood out for me was that we will ensure that meaningful connectivity for all persons, uh, that the web is safe, and, and that rights are also protected online. So there's a work cut out for all of us. And this, this is a discussion that is very essential at this time as we go through COVID-19, whether you're in confinement, whether you're coming out of lockdown, or whether you're going back into lockdown, hopefully not. So in this session, uh, we're going to be looking at the UN uh, efforts towards digital cooperation. We're also going to look at the role of regional bodies and also the role of private sector in trying to make sure that we get towards the goals that we set for ourselves. So with me on this panel, uh, very important guests. Um, I have with me, um, the first uh, uh, panelist is uh, my good friend, uh, Mr. Fabrizio Hochschild Drummond, uh, who is originally from Chile. He's a special advisor on the preparations for the commemoration of the United Nations 75th anniversary at the Under Secretary General level. That's quite a mouthful. Welcome, Fabrizio. Um, Mr. Yeah. Hochschild, who has been serving as uh, Assistant Secretary General for Strategic Cooperation a coordination in the executive office of the Secretary General since 2017. So we also have with, with us uh, Mr. Lassina Kone. Uh, he's the Director General and CEO of Smart Africa. Uh, Smart Africa is a, it's a regional body that has been doing a lot of work on the African continent to drive uh, digital um, connectivity and policy work. And they have a very exciting um, strategy that's out there, I, I would encourage you to look at their side. Prior to this, uh, Mr. Kone was the advisor to the Prime Minister of the Republic of Cote d'Ivoire from 2017 to 2018. Uh, he was in charge of digital transformation and public reforms. And he was also the advisor to the president from 2011 to 2017. So we have a very important uh, person. Welcome, um, Mr. Lassina Kone. Thank you very and much. And then for last but not Thank you. Last but not least, we have Sonia Bashir Kabir. Sonia is, is a very uh, passionate woman about, very passionate about digital, and uh, she's very well versed in the tech space. She's a technology investor focused on technical startups in emerging markets of South Asia. Uh, she's a, a currently the founder of SBK Tech Ventures and SBK Foundation, which I believe are the seen on um, the abbreviations for her name. And she also has a not-for-profit entity, uh, which believes in empowering rural communities with technology. Sonia, welcome to this panel. Thank you, Eleanor. So we'll start with you, uh, Fabrizio, uh, since you very well. Can you walk us through the, um, 
the UN, uh, the digital cooperation, and let us know what's the status of digital cooperation to date. Well, thank you very much. And let me start by saying what is what an honor it is to be with you and on such uh, a distinguished panel. I only wish I were with you in person, and even more, I wish I were with you in person in, in Costa Rica, as was originally intended. Um, the state of digital cooperation on many levels is not so great. Uh, where, uh, you know, at the, at, the, at the beginning, or some would argue halfway through, uh, digital fragmentation with the danger of the internet um, devolving into various splinter nets. And we see that in um, the international friction there is around uh, access of different companies uh, around the world. We see that in the shutdowns. We see that in the different approaches to uh, content uh, moderate, moderation and surveillance. So we're seeing increasingly uh, countries take very different attitudes towards the internet. The other major challenge is that um, there's a massive digital divide, which you alluded to, Elena, at the outset. Uh, we have just over 50% of the world connected, and we have under 50% still not connected. Uh, and among those uh, unconnected are people who are already discriminated against. There's a disproportionate, the majority of women across the world are not connected. The majority of rural populations are not connected. Many minority groups uh, have a deficit in connection. So as the developed world grows more and more develop, uh, connected, as you say, the internet ceases to be a luxury and becomes a foundation, a foundation of our education systems, a foundation of our health systems, a foundation of our economies. And what that means for those who are not connected is that they're left further behind. And the digital divide has a massive exacerbating effect on all other inequalities. And the third challenge we face next to the splinter net, the digital divide, is the disjunct between innovation um, and risk-taking in the tech sector with businesses moving at an ever more rapid speed in transforming our world and policymakers who are moving in a much more cautious, much more conservative, much more slower way. So de facto, what we're seeing is that the digital world is developing largely through a laissez-faire approach with very little policy guidance from those whose job it is to keep the public safe. So we find that there are all sorts of unintended consequences and malicious uses from a massive rise in cyber attacks to the dissemination of hate speech and discriminatory and sometimes dangerous uh, content. Now, I think at a national and in some cases at a regional level, policymakers are rapidly catching up and we see more and more instances, and I think that trend has been accelerated for COVID, of policymakers doing their jobs, of providing the guardrails for the safe use to maximize the safe use of these technologies and to curtail the harms. But at the international level, at the global level, there's still a massive deficit in uh, global policies. And that absence of global policies is facilitating the digital divides that I referred to earlier. So the Secretary General, based on the work of a very diverse, multi-stakeholder, high-level panel, and based on really very thorough conversations, I'd like to say the most thorough multi-stakeholder conversations that have ever happened in the formulation of a, of a Secretary General report, put out a series of recommendations that we believe represents a convergence of view of how we should better steer the internet moving forward. Better steer it to ensure it is helps in the fulfillment of the 2030 agenda, upholds our human rights, and reduces rather than furthers inequality. And better also in the sense to ensure that it's more secure and better fulfills our human rights rather than undermining them. 
And there are a series of recommendations in eight basic areas. The first and foremost, and the overriding priority, is gaining meaningful, affordable access for all. And that's the principal recommendation. But to do that, it means we have to greatly increase and improve our digital inclusion efforts and our capacity building efforts. And there are a series of recommendations around capacity and digital inclusion. And then if we talk about meaningful content, not just spreading the internet so that we all have uh, access to better deals online, although there's no harm in that, but more meaningful content in terms of content as it, the internet was intended in the eyes of its founder, content that would spread knowledge that would empower and allow for better international cooperation in knowledge sharing and science, we also need to boost public goods. And that's digital public goods. And that's the fourth area of recommendation. And then, of course, it's critical that the Internet is a, seri is a means to uphold our human rights, not to undermine them, and a means to improve our security and not undermine it, whether it's undermined through interstate friction or our personal uh, security. And so there are a series of recommendations around digital human rights uh, and um, uh, uh, trust, digital trust and security. Then there are also recommendations around the new and, and probably soon to be most dominant manifestation of digital technologies, which of course is artificial intelligence. And again, there are recommendations to, to, along the lines of how we can have better uh, exchanges of best practices in that area. And finally, the eighth area is trying to reinforce the existing digital governance infrastructure, which um, is is really uh, 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 needs a lot of uh, a lot of improvement to scale up to the challenges we face in the digital world. So these eight are the eight areas of the recommendations. We feel that if we're really to steer this wonderful, amazing tool to good and ensure that what we inherited and served us so well, we leave behind in a better state than it's drifting towards today. We believe that coming together behind the implementation of the roadmap will be absolutely critical. That's that's absolutely wonderful uh, to hear you, um, Fabrizio. Uh, you know, as you were speaking, I was just thinking about you know, the point you raised about the fragmentation of the internet and why we need to move towards a more united um, and focused approach. Uh, you also mentioned the need for digital inclusion, meaningful connectivity, uh, meaningful content. Um, so these are all very wonderful ideals that we really need to strive for. So I just want to, I'm coming to you, um, uh, Lasina, because I know you've been working so hard on the African continent um, looking at cooperation efforts itself through the Smart Africa um, um, initiative. So could you just let me know how, how this has been working, how has cooperation been, and how has the private sector and government, how have they been reacting towards digital cooperation efforts on the continent? Thank you very much uh, for inviting me, uh, Eleanor, and uh, good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Uh, all the people uh, observe. The pandemic has actually uh, accelerated uh, the message uh, we've been, you know, preaching for the past decade. Uh, and I'm happy to see quite a lot of digital collaboration happening uh, due to this COVID-19. We can say uh, we have we have a good problem, as I can say it, at hand, and uh, we do not want to waste it because. COVID-19 really has been able to convince many in the use of the technology to solve the issues uh, of tracing and testing and the, for the pandemic and also shown that we, we can work, you know, like shown us that, you know, we can work school uh, and, and, and transact the business from home because the social distancing, that's what is it about. We don't see in a smart Africa view, we don't see any tools that can actually concretely solve the social distanciations apart from using the ICT in these days. So uh, during this period, you know, smart Africa has released a technical advisory document to guide member states uh, to on actions to take to support 
uh, the spike in the internet utilizations while maintaining the social economic activities. The topic, you know, uh, uh, cut across e-services, e-health, education, capacity building, as mentioned by Fabrizio, <clears throat> broadband connectivity, financial services, and, you know, and, and startup ecosystem. I'm, I'm very happy that uh, many countries adopted in various ways, such as giving a free spectrum, we've seen that happening, zero rating educational, and we've even seen in Ghana actually reducing the tax rate on the on the MNOs to uh, from nine percent to five percent. We've seen that happening, and uh, uh, even mobile transactions, uh, mobile money transaction, and encouraging fintech. Now I'm moving uh, in moving forward. Really, the Smart Africa Secretariat, we are keen to sustain the use of technology that has initiated several projects to ensure. The basic enabler of connectivity becomes affordable, meaningful, and accessible. You know, in trying to make internet affordable and accessible, we did a feasibility study recently, and we found out the following uh, outcome that I will share with you: fifty percent of our member state have a GDP per capita of less than two thousand uh, dollars a year, which makes them, <clears throat> which makes them fall within the Lee, you know, within the league of at least the developed country, the LDCs. 30% of our member states in Africa here are landlocked and have uh, the least broadband penetration and uh, pay the most price for the internet use. An example, you see 72% of internet traffic usage in the member countries in Smart Africa comes from only five countries which have a direct access to the sea. So all things being equal, we expect a sevenfold increase in consumption for the next five years. So with the above in mind, and knowing that you know, the sustainable development goal by the UN, we know that we only have 10 years to go, the Secretariat has a three major project to ensure a sustainable approach towards the broadband increase in Africa. Number one is we need to interconnect all the countries in Africa with a high-speed terrestrial fiber or satellite as a backhaul solution. I know this may sound very ambitious, but Smart Africa, we have begun a project which is led by the Republic of Guinea as a, as a flagship project. The project is titled Inter Intra Africa Connectivity Project. This project will ensure across access, access to the huge capacity by the landlocked and LDC country, as well as we will be connecting countries together via high-speed bandwidth. We began implementation in January, recently in January 2020, and we are proud to announce that Mali, Guinea, Sierra Leone have been connected together. Number two, we need to make the service affordable by aggregating our internet bandwidth purchase because when we talk about connectivity, there's also something called affordability, what we call meaningful connectivity. With the current bottleneck of landlocked countries, we are expecting a sevenfold increase in internet usage. Imagine the growth we will see when interconnect all the countries together. Now, with this in mind, Smart Africa has embarked on a yet another project to secure collaboration in international with international broadband service providers by aggregating all the projected volume of the internet we expect to reduce the cost of the broadband of internet services by at least 30 percent which is very significant and a at last point is we need to focus on supporting countries with affordable last mile solution we have just concluded the development of a broadband strategy that is a project-based outlook. We identify that the last mile solution is one of the major deficit in our bid to improve the broadband penetration in Africa, which is currently at 39%, while the rest of the world is about 53, 54%. And with the Smart Africa plan, we are, uh, we are intending to increase that penetration to 50% by 2025. So we are calling on all the interest stakeholders to join us as the part of the Smart Broadband 2025 to help in developing and implementing the pilot project across member states, which will focus on ensuring connectivity in a meaningful way.
once again, thank you. That's what I have to contribute right now. <laughs> you have a lot to contribute, Lasina. Um, but you, yes. you, you mentioned some really very important points um, in this uh, in this in your submission. Um, it's very interesting yes. to note that um, thirty percent of your members have landlocked countries, and and it's uh, we. I remember we did a research at FOAI which showed that landlocked countries tend to spend a higher amounts um, in connecting. Definitely, cooperation is very important between them and the um, yes. uh, countries that are surrounded by the coast. And so with, yes. with the new players, submarine cables such as Equiano and Simba coming on board, it's important that we also look at that cooperation to bring down the cost of connecting the citizens in the landlocked country. So it's very important. It's a very important project that Smart Africa is taking up and kudos to you and your team for that effort. Thank you. So Thank coming you. to you now, Sonia, we, we want to see what's happening in South Asia. Uh, you've had all these um, interesting initiatives from Africa and, and what Fabrizio has also mentioned um, on digital cooperation. Uh, but you, you're the, one of the first ladies to, to invest in, in, te in the tech space. And I'm really curious to find out why you invest, why you chose to invest in tech or go into tech in the first place. And secondly, what do you think about digital cooperation and what it means to you as, uh, as an entrepreneur? Um, Sonia, we can't hear you, so you might have to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's great. Thank you, Eleanor. Uh, very excited to be part of this program. So my um, I'm my passion is technology. I worked with technology in Silicon Valley, and that's the only field I know. That is why I've gone on this um, journey to just promote technology. Um, as the world goes towards a digital transformation. We are seeing that um, you know technology is just a reflection of us. It is neither a divider nor is it an equalizer. It just takes the instructions we provide and it follows that. So when we're doing this digital transformation, the whole idea is to democratize technology, which means take technology to the hands of all the people, uh, the marginalized um, and, and those who do not have had access before. In order to do that, we feel that it's it just connectivity, providing just connectivity in Southeast Asia, for my example, is really not the solution. The solution we've seen is a reverse, where you begin with services that, that is meeting an unmet or unarticulated um, need that, that is solving a problem for a citizen, and that will leverage the connectivity. So what we're seeing here is that technology is allowing us to solve problems which haven't been solved before. And another uh, differentiation here is that most people think technology is just about disruption by going from manual to automation. That is really not technology. It is. Um, it has to solve a problem. It has to be meaningful, and it has to meet the needs of the people. Um, in, in, the, in Southeast Asia, we're seeing that uh, we have a lot of people and uh, data is, is now currency, data is, is electricity. We are able to solve problems and generate a lot of data from which we can share with the other parts of the world, the other parts of the emerging market and solve problems. So I couldn't have been more happier than now to be part of this, um, to witness the global digital cooperation that is going to be happening. to touch a bit on what you just mentioned about uh, technology is allowing us to solve problems uh, which are meaningful and also relevant so a quick one from your personal experience what what one problem do you think that in your experience technology has been able to allow us to solve so I'm speaking from experience from the Southeast Asia perspective after the pandemic where people's movement was restricted and you there was a requirement to meet doctors or consult with doctors. We have seen a lot of health tech startups emerge where services could be telemedicine, teleconsultation was being able to give through technology where you could connect the patient and the doctor. Another area we've seen that has really sprung forward is education as children could not go to schools or universities we have seen that ed tech or t putting in technology in education and, and 
teaching through um, digital skills or digital means has taken a leap forward. And the third area that we've seen the technology has really helped is the fintech space where payments are being made digitally as opposed to in person going to banks or exchanging cash. Yeah. No, no, those, so those are very important points. And I think it's not just um, peculiar to South Asia alone. I think you can, you can see this in a lot of developing regions across the world. So that's, it's very important to hear these, these examples. So coming back to you, um, uh, Fabrizio, um, we've, we've talked about um, your digital cooperation and you mentioned a lot about global connectivity in your, in your discussions about the need to have meaningful connectivity, the need to look at it in holistically. So I, I wanted to hear a little bit about um, invest. Sorry, I think I'm coming to you rather, Lasina, uh, not the Lasina first. Um, you remember that uh, digital we we uh, FOAI, that's my organization, uh, work very closely with the World Bank on the digital moonshot for Africa, and uh, we we had a report that came out, and one key aspect of that uh, report said that um, there was an estimation of about. Uh, over about $109 billion was needed to bring Africa to universal access. So we are talking about 4G equivalent um, of, of technology, um, being able to connect at that rate, um, be also being able to get very important devices, um, having connectivity at all times in, in different places. So I wanted to ask you about your members, particularly um, private sector and, and governments, um, how do you think, uh, what, what would you think will incentivize them to be able to take advantage of, of this gap and, and be able to invest to close the gap? Thank you very much. Yes, to be precise, you talk about a funding gap, which is close to 110, yeah. 120 billion uh, US dollars uh, for Africa. We, the incentives is quite very interesting. But before we even talk about incentive, let's look at the USF itself, Universal, uh, Universal Access Fund. Uh, that was put together by most of the African country, I said, uh, including Smart Africa country members. Uh, if we look back, which was created 10, 15, 20 years ago, the time it was created, who were the stakeholders? It was the government and the regulators and the MNOs to give a basic connectivity. Back in the days, we were only familiar with the just said, GSM telephone, 2G or 3G. But today we have uh, application service providers which are also taken into account in terms of stakeholdership. I think this conversation goes together with the track that we have within the broadband commissions that we call 21st century financing model. It's very important to solve together is for us to think back and say, okay, if something worked 20 years ago with this limited funds of the universal access funds paid mainly by the operators, shall we continue with that model? Or should we look holistically and look at the entire ecosystem and the value chain to see how do we finance that gap? Because 120 billion 120 billion US dollars for 54 country, you know, it's quite a lot of money. It's almost like a, a third of the total debt in Africa annually, which is estimated for about 370 something billion US dollars. So for us, what we did in South Africa is we came out with this uh, project, we call it Broadband Strategy 2025. How do we contribute into shrinking that funding gap? by inviting private sector. We call this, this is ambassadorial program. What does that actually mean? It means work together with the regulators to ease up the regulations in countries in terms of licensing and authorizations for FTTH kind of thing, for last mile access solutions, concrete project, which will allow the 30% unconnected people in Africa, because remember, 39% of Africa has a connectivity to broadband. We have about 30% which have connectivity, but not affordable. We have another 30% which is not connected at all because the funding gap will help actually to finance all of that. 
So we are encouraging private sector members who are with us together with the regulators of each country to actually contribute to the uh, in increased penetration of this broadband, which will eventually decrease the funding gap by 2025. And our objective is to reach about 50% broadband connectivity in terms of meaningful broadband connectivity by 2025. That's what we've been doing in Smart Africa regarding that funding gap. You've raised an important point about regulations, and uh, it, it's yeah. we can't stress how important having a very good, uh, solid regulatory environment can help to stimulate uh, investments. So thank you for mentioning that. I'm um, coming to you, Sonia. You've heard about um, the challenges that are within the Africa space. I wanted to find out whether they were with the were some, from, uh, similar in within uh, South Asia as well. Uh, because you you are within the tech space and you're also an entrepreneur, but what are some of the challenges that you've seen, and what kind of investments do you think uh, are needed to be able to close that funding gap in technology? Thank you, Eleanor. Um, so basically, I think one of the things that we're seeing is that connectivity is really dependent on on, on fiber or cable. And there needs to be more invention on how connectivity is provided. Um, so there's many other exploring uh, activities happening saying, can you provide connectivity through unused bandwidth of the television? Microsoft has a product called White Space, TV White Space, where they're saying everybody has a television. Can they use the unused bandwidth of the TV and then provide connectivity so citizens can get access? Um, the funding gap is definitely big in Southeast Asia. All the government are trying to lay out the fiber and give access. But I think the issue is more, um, is not just related to the government, it is also the private sector. Because once we say we have provided connectivity, that doesn't really solve the problem. What will the people do yeah. with the connectivity? So that the services that need to be built on after connectivity has been provided is where all the tech giants the tech companies are focusing, saying there has to be a need. Like right now, connectivity in, in Southeast Asia, if you ask people, they don't ask, they don't say whether they have connectivity. They say they have Facebook. So Facebook and connectivity have become very synonymous because they, the penetration is high. But when we're seeing with post-COVID, with, with services of health, education, and fintech taking place, we're see, that's where we see that the funding gap can be solved by investing more on technologies that's all the problem of the people so that they are willingly able and also um, affordable to get the connectivity. Yeah, and Sonia, I like the fact that you you you, you talked about the uh, uh, social media is not the full experience of the internet. Uh, often people tend to look at that and, and then, um, but the a very important point you also mentioned was about alternative and complementary technologies like community networks, you talked about TV white spaces. These are all very important parts of the ecosystem that sometimes we tend to focus a lot on, on mobile, which is fine because mobile has been the, the, the pioneer in this space, but it's important that we are looking at investments in new technologies as well. So uh, thank you for raising that, that very great point. So coming to you, Fabrizio, um, you've, you've heard the comments that have come from Nasina, you've heard from Sonia, about some of the challenges and the investment gap. Uh, how do you think the UN um, Digital Cooperation Roadmap can help us to address some of these challenges that have been mentioned? You know, well, we, we have to uh, highlight that amidst the challenges, there are many great things happening. And even the picture in Africa is, is very, very varied. I mean, you have countries like Chad, like uh, Niger, like Central Africa, where I served, like Burundi, that have um, a connectivity rates of under or around uh, 10%. And of course, they're tremendously disadvantaged. But then you have countries like uh, Botswana, uh, South Africa, Rwanda, where connectivity rates are, are well over 50%. And then, of course, you have Kenya, that seems to be ahead of everyone, um, with uh, over 90%, some 90% of the population having access to the internet. And why does that happen? Kenya has been tremendously innovative, talking about overcoming some of the, um, the some of the, the, the infrastructure challenges. We just saw a few weeks ago, Kenya 
using um, uh, balloons to, to bring uh, internet connectivity to, to remote um, areas. Uh, I think the problem is, is there's very little global steerage. So the best practices are not adequately shared, not adequately coordinated. We have many outstanding efforts going on, but they're not necessarily to scale. And that's what we need. We need better co coordination. We need greater focus on those who are most uh, excluded. And we need to bring uh, efforts to scale. And I think what the roadmap does is provide the framework, the global blueprint that has been lacking. But the challenge now that we have the blueprint is to get all the different stakeholders, the private sector, uh, civil society, the tech community, and above all governments onto the building site and get them working together on this blueprint. Otherwise, we're going to have these, continue to have these very fragmented efforts with some uh, countries charging ahead, others being totally forgotten and left behind. And we're going to end up with greater inequality across the world and greater inequality within many countries. So I think now we need to rally behind the plan. We need to share better best practices. We need to bring our efforts uh, to scale and do that above all by cooperating much better. As um, Lacina indicated, where countries come together to negotiate together uh, access to broadband deals, they're gonna get much more uh, better prices. And that's gonna lead um, to overcoming the affordability gap, um, where regulatory frameworks, tax frameworks uh, are better coordinated the likelihood is we'll get better access. Where investment is coordinated and better steered and better targeted at the most uh, excluded, will progressively overcome the connectivity gap. But it's not going to happen unless we cooperate, coordinate better. And we can't coordinate and cooperate better unless we have an overarching plan. And that I think we've got with the Secretary General's roadmap, which is, you know, the Secretary General's roadmap but it was put together with unprecedented uh, multi-stakeholder consultation. And thus, I think, really represents the world's roadmap. And, 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 and Fabrizio, when you mentioned the, uh, that we should get behind the, the, um, the roadmap, I do understand that the UN has offices in almost every country. Would that be a, a great place to start um, in, in um, convening around some of the key um, pillars with, un, under this roadmap? Well, I, I personally think we need to focus most on, on those left um, uh, behind at the moment, the 47 least developed mm -hmm. countries with connectivity rates of 19% or under. And in all those countries, uh, I believe the UN uh, has, uh, has offices. And we need to look at those countries one by one. The deficits um, um, to ensuring meaningful, affordable access are very different country by country. And I think part of the problem right. is that to date, capacity building efforts have been supply driven, not needs driven. It's been individuals, companies right. saying these are the capacities you need to operate our projects. It's been individual countries coming in and saying, this is our approach to cybersecurity. And within our national approach, this is the approach you need to adopt to be harmonious with our approach. We need to turn that logic around and we need to do as we do, have long done on the development side, have long done on the humanitarian side. We need to look at what are the individual needs, what are the individual capacities in those countries and develop capacity building around the specific needs um, and strengths of the country concerned. And the UN can help in that. And two UN agencies, the United Nations Development Program and the International Telecommunications Union, are scaling up their capacity to do precisely that. And then we also have resident coordinators in all those countries. But we also need, uh, because it's going to take resources, um, you know, it's estimated that it will cost 100 billion um, to ensure universal access, affordable access in Africa by 2030. I think it's estimated that it will cost four times that sum 
to ensure it across the whole world. So we also need to build a platform of private investors, of international financial institutions, and of um, the financially more advantaged countries uh, in order to get the investment um, platform in place uh, to, to ensure that we, we reach those countries. So it's going to take a multitude of efforts from different angles. It's no small undertaking, but it's an absolutely vital undertaking if we really want to meet the SDGs by 2030, unless we do it in the digital realm. And I think COVID, as uh, Lassina has, has said, um, unless COVID has taught us that, unless we do it in the digital realm, um, it, we're past the point where we can just focus on the SDGs through an analog uh, angle. And I would also, you know, echo what was said by Sonia, who said, you know, the digital reflects how we are. I think um, more than reflecting how we are, it uh, magnifies how we are. So it can either magnify the reduction of inequalities, or it can uh, magnify inequalities per se. It's a magnifier, it's an accelerator, and it's an enhancer. And at the moment, left to drift, it's sort of moving in the wrong direction. And we need to take the bull by the horns and steer it back towards being an accelerator, a turbocharge for meeting the SDGs. And I think if we work better together uh, and using the UN system as a platform, uh, we can do that. My Fabrizio, I am very wary of the time because you. I know you have to uh, drop off early. So uh, unless, of course, something has changed, and uh, I just wanted to thank you for your contributions, and um, and and we hope to to have you at another time. And we are really looking forward to rallying behind the UN um on on this digital cooperation because it's so important we need to get this lifeline so thank you for joining us um fabrizio so we the rest of us are still on the panel we are not going anywhere i'm coming back to you sonia right now um you you mentioned just like fabrizio has said you talked about the 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 role of um digital being a magnifier um, but it also exposes some of the fragilities um, within the space, some of the harms, and it shows. Uh, it also exposed the digital gender gap as well. So I just wanted to find out from you, um, from your experience working in um, in Bangladesh and and maybe generally in, in the tech space. Uh, we, you know, you, you've, I'm sure you've come across the discrimination that women face in the space and some of the um, the issues they fa face in terms of digital rights. What do you think are some of the hidden dangers with, um, with pursuing a digital economy? And what can we do? What can policymakers do to ensure that we have women who are participating in the digital space, but also staying there to be able to make an impact? Thank you, Alador. So, you know, as, uh, as the fourth industrial revolution kicks in, we need to really look at the value of inclusion. It's not about men losing jobs to women when we talk about inclusion. It's about humans losing to automation. That is what the fourth industrial revolution brings. So I think that the inclusion of women is a joint responsibility with, with all stakeholders and exclusion has joint risks. Um, so women traditionally are, are not very um, uh, aggressive in, in, in technology. And when we begin, when we talk about the digital cooperation, it is it is a whole host of issues that need to be addressed from from the policy perspective, from the employer's perspective, and from the perspective of women themselves. Let me begin by talking about women themselves. I think that it, the time has come now for women to be more ambitious and to be more aggressive than before. If you are, if you want to win a game, you cannot be a spectator. You have to play the game. You will either win or you will lose. So it is, it is upon women, and it's a call to all women to say, please show up. You need to be in the game because nobody is going to play for you. You need to do that. As women come, more and more women are coming, especially in the tech field. We are seeing that the numbers are increasing. There's a lot of focus on STEM from, uh, from academia, from industry to promote women's participation. Then we need the policymakers and the private sectors to unite and make it easier for women to come. So the digital literacy skills have to be increased from the academia perspective, 
and especially targeting for women because there is a gap they need to fill to come forward. And then from the policy perspective, an equal opportunity or making, you know, bridging it easier, making it easier for women to come into play. So, um, talking about women also seizing the opportunities that are, um, you know, are coming up uh, and also participating in the policy making process, making sure that their rights are being heard, that they are empowered and that they are also coming to the showing up uh, to be counted at the table. So I'm coming to you, Lasina, right now. Um, you've had Sonia's submissions from uh, South Asia. Smart Africa, uh, what is Smart Africa doing in terms of its strategy and policies to address the digital gender gap um, and to ensure that there's inclusion across board uh, so that nobody is left behind in the development of the digital economy? Yes, uh, thank you very much for your questions. And uh, in Smart Africa here, we do have that included throughout the entire, the whole paradigm of the digital transformations, which is promoting girls and ICT. You probably know that already, or you've seen that through our flagship summit, what we call Transform Africa Summit, where every Transform Africa Summit, we do have a competition called Miss Gig. And the MISGIC, which is very important, Girls and ICT Days, together also with the ITU, we do celebrate that. And uh, even through the uh, SATA program, which is a Smart Africa Talent Academy that we put together, the Smart Africa Talent Academy, it's a vehicle to actually carry the capacity building within the community of the Smart Africa members. So within that, you know, there are even specific training, specific courses towards the girls and women in ICT and to support innovation entrepreneurship in the women's sector in order to balance the gap or digital divide, a gender divide in terms of embracing technology. And we do that also, in fact, a Smart Africa can be a typical, Smart Africa can be a typical alliance to promote that because within the ICT ministers of the Smart Africa country members, Women are the majority of the ICT ministers. So we also <laughs> use the women. <laughs> exactly. If you take an example in South Africa, in, in West Africa, within the ECOWAS country, the women are majority. Majority of ICT ministers are, are, are women. Yeah. So uh, they help a lot with the promotion yeah. too. <laughs> yeah, actually, I do know that the minister for, for Rwanda, minister of ICT for Ghana, uh, for Benin as well. So you're right. Uh, there are quite a lot of women ICT well, ministers. Well, they, so I'm just let, let, me be precise. let me be precise. Minister of ICT Senegal, Mali, Benin, Togo, Burkina Faso, Rwanda, yes. South Africa, Ghana. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's their majority. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but it's, okay, it's very ahead. impressive and good to know. So it means that we're expecting to see a lot more infusion of, of uh, gender into policy making at, at the regional level and, and to ensure that that comes through um, in, in, in the strategies that we are developing as well. So we, we, we just have about um, eight minutes to the top of the hour. And um, I'm just going to check if we have any comments coming in or any questions. Um, so I can't see any for now. So I think we could just go into, you know, just looking at the final uh, level now. We've talked about digital cooperation. We've talked about inclusion. We've talked about the funding gaps now. What should be the next steps from here? What should be the first things that we should tackle in order to start the, 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 the steps towards achieving universal, uh, meaningful and affordable access? So I'll start with you, Lasina. What should be the role of uh, Smart Africa in this space? What should be the first things you should be tackling? Thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity. From now on, we must understand nothing will and nothing should be the same again. For that, mm -hmm. as we know the role of the technology of digital transformation, what does it do in the social economic development? I think number one thing our country members, I think in particular and in general in Africa, we should understand, actually digital transformation should be an essential service. It is no longer a, uh, a luxury service, as you mentioned it before. So if we have a digital transformation as an essential service, what does that really mean? 
it means that if you are going to build a hospital, you must be thinking about a platform for digital, for connectivity at the distance. If you're thinking about school, you must be thinking about the digital. If you think about a private business, you must be thinking about the B, business to customer, which is a B2C. The government itself must actually uh, embrace digital at its heart. At its heart, what does that really mean? It means e-services. There's no digital transformations as long as the public service and private service are transformed into a digital services. So that's why the digital transformation, the message, the takeaway message that I really want to leave here, the digital transformation, it is not one sector. It is the sector that goes through the whole other sector of the economy that makes it transversal. So we must be focusing on that in order to fight the COVID and similar pandemic yet to come in the future to be able to be a digital world and to be respecting social distancing. It is our only way out. Yeah, I love I love that. Uh, you start, you know how digital is like the backbone, and everybody else is just uh, you know joining to it, and that's how come you know we that's how we we can get to grow um, as well. So Sonia, what about you? Um, in terms of you, uh, you know, what, what do you think the the key steps should be? The immediate steps towards reaching that goal of ensuring that we have universal access beyond the pandemic. And, and to be able to be prepared for future pandemics um, um, as well. Um, thank you, Eleanor. So I think I'm going to take a little bit of a private sector approach in answering your question. Sure. Because we've talked yes, about connectivity and yeah, we've talked about connectivity and we've talked about it being affordable. But really, the point that I'm trying to make is that economies of scale kick in when a lot of people use any product or service. So connectivity is very similar. It's, it's, it, it, it should be free like the air we breathe, but the air is required for us oxygen. We need oxygen to live. So connectivity should be similar. We shouldn't just fight for connectivity. We should have services built upon that connectivity so that it is the oxygen of people's lives, so that it, a service depends on connectivity. And connectivity is a byproduct. It is not the product. In order to do that, I think we should have, have all countries unite and the United Nations is a great example. The least developed countries, as Fasina mentioned, the 47 of them, we should sit together and see how do we bring the costs down of providing connectivity to citizens. But that's only the first step. The answer really is in what services are we building on that the citizens will use connectivity to make their life better, to be digitally included and, and, and it let it become the oxygen for people's services. All right, thank you, Sonia. And uh, just when I thought I was wrapping up, I've just seen two questions that have come up. So um, I, I would just, uh, you know, there's just one here about, uh, to you, Lasina, global financial institutions uh, and governments, private sector, do you think they are aligned in terms of investments? And then, and, and Sonia, I'll come to you with this question. Um, how do you think, how resilient um, can the scaling up of, of um, accessibility be uh, to the impacts and consequences of climate change. So we'll come to you, Lasina, first. Uh, the question about the global financial institutions and whether they are, you know, aligned with private sector and governments, or are they going in separate directions? <laughs> you know, I like, I like this minute. question because <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I, like, I like to be bold. You see, when it comes in terms of Africa, the global financial institutions, not all of them, there are certainly exceptions. You can see the percentage of investment going into the ICT into Africa. That will make you understand what is the real visions. For me as a Smart Africa Director General, on the name of the Smart Africa, I think African countries need to take their own responsibility in terms of connectivity. Connectivity in order to uh, innovate and also to, to transform. You can't transform if you don't have a connectivity, you don't have so. If you look at the global financial institutions today, the focus will be, of course, uh, the fundamental of Maslow hierarchy, which is uh, having a hospital, having roads, having schools, having so on and so forth. I'm not saying it's really bad. And the global for the global financial institutions today, the direction and the vision is 
Africa is seen to be the number one exporter of that raw material, number one exporter of that material. I am saying Africa and Africans, we need to stop being exporter. We have to be the producer. We have to stop consuming. In order for us to stop consuming and producing, the fourth industrial revolution is our way out. Why? Because we have 800 million population younger than 30 years old. It is also a resource. Why we cannot be? Africa together is about 1.3 billion population. So that is my answer. I think they need to revisit the priority in terms of investment into each African country to give a bigger priority to digital transformation. That is what I'm asking. All right. So you, you're challenging the investment um, community to, to rethink the way they look at Africa um, in terms of priorities. So that's a message to anybody who's listening. All right. Thank you so much, um, Lasina and Sonia. In uh, You have a minute. Uh, do you think you can do it? A response yes, to I the can. question about... So, uh, yeah, really right. quickly. Uh, the climate change and, and technology, the ICT footprint is very important for climate change because, as we all know, traditional servers and equipments cause a lot of heating. So the, the race is on for green computing. Um, all the big tech giants are looking at alternatives for not polluting the earth with such heat and technology. We're looking at all alternatives that can reduce the, the climate change effect. So that's my short answer. Thank you so much. And uh, we are just on time. Um, I, my, my guests have been Fabrizio Hochschild, who had, had to leave uh, much earlier, uh, Lasina uh, Kone for Smart Africa, and Sonia uh, Bashir Kabir of um, SBK. You've been such a wonderful uh, panel, um, and there's so much more we've learned. We need to get behind the UN uh, uh, digital cooperation. We have uh, work cut out for us to make sure that nobody's left behind, that everybody has meaningful uh, and affordable connectivity and feel safe online and can utilize the full uh, benefits of, of the internet. So thank you so much, RightsCon, for having us uh, on this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.